Recording. Okay. Um, all right. So cholesterol uh, does get a gets some bad press. Okay. So typically when people think of cholesterol, they think of this is bad. All right. Now keep in mind, cholesterol is an import, important dietary lipid. Okay, it has uh, a lot of functions, some of which include um, your, creating your bile salts, which will help with uh, bile, okay, which is stored in the gallbladder. And that will help you emulsify your fats, okay? Which is a very important process. Okay, it also uh, synthesizes some of your steroid hormones, such as your androgens. which are estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Okay, it is part of the vitamin D synthesis process and is a major component of the integrity of your cell membranes. Okay, so cholesterol is not necessarily a bad thing. However, it can spin out of control and cause some problems, which we'll talk about that as well. Okay, about 15% of your cholesterol comes from your diet and about 85% is manufactured in the liver. Okay, so in other words, in general, about the best you can do to improve your cholesterol score through diet alone is about 15%. Okay, and the rest is genetic uh, what your liver will make, starting with the acetyl coenzyme A, um, which is part of your fatty acid synthesis. Okay. Okay. Cholesterol is lost from the body when it is broken down and secreted in bile salts. Okay. And then eventually uh, that is secreted in feces. Okay. And the bile salts are a steroid acid that's found in bile that's stored in the gallbladder, okay, to help you emulsify fats, which means uh, you're bringing fat and water together because normally they would like to repel, but when you emulsify them, you're actually bringing them together. Okay, so cholesterol and triglycerides are insoluble in water and cannot circulate in the bloodstream by themselves. So they need to be transported in a lipoprotein. Okay, so that's a lipid protein uh, called a lipoprotein. So in the presence of these lipoproteins, uh, it creates a vehicle for the transportation. And these uh, lipoproteins are right here, okay? Your very low density lipoproteins Okay, or VLDL, your low density lipoproteins. Okay, and then your high density uh, 
lipoproteins. Okay, lipoproteins contain triglycerides, a phospholipid, cholesterol, and a protein. So those are the ingredients that make up a lipoprotein. Okay, your liver is the source or what synthesizes the VLDLs, very low density lipoproteins. Okay, so instead of kind of reading all this to you, I'm gonna just, we're gonna draw it out. Um, okay, so uh, kind of in a nutshell, what happens is That is a terrible liver. It's trying to draw a liver. Okay. So, um, go, so your liver will make these VLDLs, very low density lipoproteins. Okay, by the time they're released from the liver, they turn into LDLs, okay? An LDL, you can kind of look at it as a vehicle, and inside of it has cholesterol. Okay, now as these LDLs are floating around in your body, All right, it will deposit the cholesterols where it needs it, okay? Sometimes what happens is, is you can get too many uh, cholesterols floating around, okay? Now that's where your HDLs come in. Okay, for now, uh, kind of look at an HDL as a, um, a deflated balloon. Okay, a deflated balloon. And if we put something into that deflated balloon, it goes from deflated to inflated. Okay. So the HDLs will float around the body and they start collecting the, uh, they start collecting all the extra cholesterols. And just as you would imagine, if it's a deflated balloon and you're adding a bunch of stuff inside of it, eventually it gets filled with the uh, leftover cholesterols. And then this goes back to the liver and the uh, HDLs that has all the cholesterol in it releases it and then it gets converted back into VLDLs. Okay. And then the cycle starts all over again. So that's why HDLs are known as the good cholesterol, and the LDLs are known as the bad cholesterol. Now, I personally don't like this term because LDLs are not necessarily the bad guys, okay? We need LDLs, we need cholesterol. Cholesterol does need to be sent out into the body so that it can do its thing, right? Bile salts, androgen hormones, integrity of cell membranes, and so on. The problem is when things start to spin out of control. And when that happens, which we'll look at in a little bit, you can start to hurt the blood vessels 
and create the plaque formation and all that stuff. Okay, so that's why I don't think um, that's a very accurate term saying the LDLs are the bad guy. What would be better is to say you have cholesterol, everybody does, you need it, but currently you are going down a route that is going to take a normal function and spin it out of control. Okay, so we got to get the out of control part under control. Okay, so the other thing is the um, you can increase your HDL levels by exercise. It's the best way to increase those numbers. And you can decrease your LDLs by diet. I think that's fair. I think that's safe and a good idea. Nothing wrong at all with cleaning up the diet. I think that's a great idea. All right. Okay, so these next slides is what we just drew out. All right. Um, okay, an LDL score is going to depend on the author, the company, the organization. Okay, I've seen lots of different scores. Um, for LDL, the lower the better, okay? So uh, some people, some authors and docs and all that, they wanna see uh, 160. Okay, um, 180 might be from another company, 200, okay, from another one. But you really don't want to exceed uh, 200, okay? After that, then it's worth um, diving in to figure out what's going on, okay? So LDLs, the lower, the better. And the reason why is the link and the risk of uh, atherosclerosis. Okay, the HDLs are considered the good cholesterol. And for this particular one, higher the number or the score, the better. Okay, so 60 plus is considered really good. Um, so there's your range, 35 to 60, uh, but the bigger, the better for HDLs. Okay, now some practitioners consider an LDL score of 100 sissy at risk for factors for depositing plaque and all that on the walls of the arteries, but really it's inflammation that is to blame, okay? Not your LDLs inflammation. Okay, chronic inflammation by definition means you've had uh, the issue actually more accurately here, 14. Okay, 14 days or more. Usually uh, day one to seven is acute. Okay, now this depends on the type of injury we're dealing with, okay? You've got your sprained ankle, so sports injuries, version of acute, subacute. Then you have tissue, like uh, organ 
injury, like your heart is hurt, the liver is hurt, okay, the brain is hurt, like concussion stuff. Uh, you've got significant trauma, so severe trauma. You've got anaphylaxis, so swelling. And, you know, so there's different variations of acute, subacute. and chronic, okay? So uh, in general, you can kind of look at acute as the injury is day one to day seven. Subacute is day seven to 14, and chronic is day 14 and longer, okay? Sometimes people are hurt so bad, acute can be, you know, four weeks. <clears throat> All right, so it just depends on the situation. But the idea is chronic, it's been there a long time. <clears throat> okay, microorganisms can produce toxins that can stimulate tissue damage reactions. <clears throat> okay, uh, that is, <clears throat> excuse me, that's very important to understand that these toxins can hurt you. Hold Okay. Uh, can y'all hear me? Just loud and clear. Okay, because I just got some messages, audio cut out. All right. Okay, so this stuff is, uh, I think, very, very important to understand because this does have to do with overall health. Okay, microorganisms, not good. Prolonged irritation, also not good. Okay, so there's your chronic. Okay, prolonged irritation. Because of chemicals, physical irritants, mechanical abnormalities. Okay, so chemicals could be anywhere from side effects of drugs, medications, um, alcoholism, um, pesticides, you know, whatever. Just dealing and working with chemicals and substances that are just not good for you or the body. Okay, physical irritants uh, and mechanical abnormalities. Okay, so these would be like repetitive motion, abnormal repetitive motion things over time. Okay, an example is the heart beats on average 60 to 100 times a minute. So there's a constant expansion and contraction of the heart and the blood vessels that go with it, right? The cardiac vessels. And if there are irritants in there and mechanical abnormalities, such as uh, high blood pressure and nutritional deficiencies, then the integrity of the walls of the blood vessels are not gonna be very good and they're gonna start to crack and fissure. And then cholesterol is gonna go in there and try to fix it, okay? Granulocytes, which is a type of scarring, 
from tuberculosis or from silicosis or rheumatoid arthritis or polymyositis or toxoplasmosis, which can lead to um, an enlarged liver and spleen. So the hepatosplenomegaly is an enlarged liver and spleen. Swollen lymph nodes, uh, myalgia, so muscle aches, fatigue. Okay, calcium infiltration. Keep in mind, calcium is always recruited during macro and micro trauma. Okay, calcium is always recruited with macro and micro trauma. So in other words, you hurt tissue and you're going to bring in calcium, okay, calcium deposits. And if you get enough calcium deposits over time, then the integrity of that tissue becomes abnormal, okay? Also, uh, hyalinization, so like abnormal uh, scar tissue and other abnormal tissue repair. Okay, so these are side effects of chronic inflammation. The body, which does try to heal itself, will undergo either repair or resolution, okay? Resolution is where the tissue goes back to its original uh, structure and physiologic function. So basically it goes back to 100%. Okay, so that does happen with some injuries where your body gets hurt and it can resolve itself, which means tissue and function and all that goes back to 100%. But uh, most of the time, it, your body gets hurt and then it just repairs it, which means it does not go back to 100%. So let's say you get hurt and you were at 100%, okay, whatever that tissue was, okay, and then you get hurt. Now your body is going to do the healing process. Okay, and then it does the best it can, and it ends, let's say, right there. Okay, so now it went back to 95%. Not quite at 100, but 95%. Okay, so that would be an example of repair. Now, some people, when they get hurt, because of the nature of the injury and their age and all that kind of thing, okay, maybe that's where it was. So they got hurt and it started to get better, but it only went back to about 50% function. And that's just as good as it's gonna get. Okay, so that would be repair. All right, so uh, you're left with scarring or scar tissue. Uh, the tensile strength has changed. And um, this statement here, cortisone shots, uh, the reason why I have it is because multiple Uh, cortisone shots over time um, uh, changes the integrity of tissue. So basically it hurts tissue. It makes it weaker. Okay. So you have to be very careful uh, when you're dealing with cortisone shots. Um, the rule is one every six months, but you'll find people that get like one every five weeks and they just keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, you're, you're gonna hurt tissue if you keep doing that, okay? All right, this is a, uh, a very good slide because it's gonna talk about um, why cholesterol is not necessarily the bad guy when it comes to heart disease or vascular disease, but it's inflammation, okay? So what happens is, 
is you have a person that has damage to the endothelial lining. Okay, so there's a crack and a fissure to the tunica intima of the blood vessel. And things that can cause this are things like hypertension. Okay, so high blood pressure, smoking, uh, too much fat in the system, so hyperlipidemia, hyperhomocysteinemia, okay, which is a protein metabolism problem. Hemodynamic factors. So there's just something not quite right as blood is traveling through the tubes. So hemodynamics, toxins, viruses, and immune reactions. And I'm a lot of people, this is where they're living. All these things are hitting them. Okay, two or three of them, five of them, all of them. Um, and this is not the exhaustive list either. Okay, so other things that's pretty important is uh, deficiencies. So nutritional deficiencies. So what happens is a combination of all these things start to uh, hurt the tunica intima. Okay, so here's an enlarged view of it. And your body goes, oh, no problem. No problem at all. I can fix that. So monocytes start to come into the hurt site. Okay. Then what happens is over time, lipids start to get deposited. They, they slip in through the crack. Literally, they slip through the crack and they start to fill the layer between the tunica intima and the tunica media. Okay, and as you can see there, you've got the uh, inside most layer, tunica intima, and then you've got the muscle layer, the tunica media, and the fat starts to get put in between those two layers. Now, also keep in mind that the reason for this is likely a combination of these things. And these things have not been removed. They're still smoking, okay? Still dealing with their high blood pressure. They're always sick. Diet is terrible. On and on the list goes, all right? So they're not really doing anything to change uh, their lifestyle, which means this is only gonna get worse, okay? It's what got you there to begin with, and now it's only gonna get worse. Okay, as time goes by, as you can see here, the plaque and the fatty infiltration and all that stuff starts to get thicker, okay? It starts to grow, all right? So the macrophages uh, continue to do their job. Platelets come in and start to adhere together and create, you know, stickiness and adhesions and stuff like that. Um, the... This one shows it pretty good, uh, what happens. So we have those LDLs that enter first, right? So the macrophages come in and the LDLs come in, which are your so-called cholesterol. And once they get inside, they get oxidized, okay? Uh, because of the inflammation. The oxidized LDLs allow things to become sticky, so they create adhesions and thus enters the monocytes. Okay, also T lymphocytes come in. Uh, the monocytes turn into macrophages and the macrophages start to consume, as you can see here, they start to, like a vacuum cleaner, consume the large amounts of LDLs. And when it does that, it transforms these LDLs into foam cells. Okay, once the LDL gets inside the macrophage, it's now called a foam cell. And then the foam cells release a growth factor that begins your lipid pool. Okay, 
the foam cells release a growth factor that encourages more plaque and more lipids to be deposited. Okay, now this is the body's job. So in other words, the LDL is doing its job. That's why I don't really like it that, you know, why they call it the, the bad cholesterol. I'm like, it's not bad. It's just doing its job. What's bad is the inflammation. What's bad is the damage. Okay. So um, chances are the person is still going to be in this state, right? Because it's very hard for people to change uh, diet and lifestyle. Okay. And um, so in other words, the infarct or the problem has not been removed and the body is going to still going to um, manufacture the foam cells. Okay. And you're still going to get the cracking and the fissuring and the tearing of the endothelial lining, which means the process is just going to continue. Now you're starting to get more scar tissue. Okay. More fibrous collagenous tissue. Uh, fibroblasts are now starting to come in, in, in uh, greater numbers. Okay. The lipid pool, the foam cells, the plaque formation continues to get thicker over time. And then eventually this nice, pretty big open lumen that had a nice big diameter is now like, oh, let's just say 95% blocked. I mean, look at that. Okay. And then because of, you know, more of this, still smoking, still drinking, still eating like crap, still stressed, all the usual suspects, which means everything is toxic and nothing is going well they're also going to get blood clots somewhere, right? So um, other areas of the body may develop uh, thrombus. The thrombus may develop in that exact area. And so uh, your body will throw the clot. And when you try to get a piece of material that is this big, okay, through a tiny hole like that, it's just not going to happen. It's going to get stuck, right? And once it gets, it gets stuck at that point, you're going to have decreased oxygen, decreased blood flow, okay, which means decreased ATP, which means decreased fuel, which means no working tissue, okay? So if it's your heart, the heart cells just stop because you're not getting oxygen and ATP and all that stuff to it, all right? And then the cells die. So if it's in your brain, that's a stroke. If it's in the heart, that's a heart attack. Uh, this can happen also in your body. You know, you can get a clot in your leg with different vascular disease. Okay, and this is kind of a, a flow chart of when you get injury and inflammation, they tend to feed off of each other and takes a bad situation worse. Okay, you get a release of all the histamines and leukotrienes, all that is inflammatory mediators. Calcium is always recruited. The vessels get thick, more calcium comes in. Okay, and then as time goes by, you can start to get increased peripheral resistance, which means it increases blood pressure. And that also takes a bad situation worse. Okay. Um, inflammation and healing. Okay. Quick version. It takes time. Onset of injury. All right. The first four weeks. Okay, so your first month is going to be the most important, right? So you, because that's when the body is really working hard to try to fix itself, all right? So when you get hurt, 
uh, you have your onset of injury. And so basically the first three days suck. Okay. You've got the injury with a quick vasoconstriction followed by vasodilation and increased capillary permeability, which means you're gonna get swelling. Okay, and edema in the area, it's gonna be very tender. Okay, it's gonna be sore, all right. Um, the usual suspects come in right? So your mast cells, neutrophils, macrophages, lymphocytes, fibroblasts, epithelial cells, okay, they all start to come in to the site, okay? Part of some of these Pac-Mans are to break down the dead tissue. Okay, when you get hurt, chances are you've now hurt uh, some cells, okay? You've popped blood vessels, you've got you know, bruising, which is a hematoma, which is leaking of red blood cells. And all those things were eventually going to die. And the blunt trauma, or whatever happened, you know, things are just going to die. So you need these Pac-Mans to come in to start cleaning things up. Okay. So this is all normal. This is just what's happening. But this is what's happening in the particular timeline. So the first three days are usually the worst. Okay. Then the, the next up to 10 days, um, your body is going to slowly start doing a U-turn to get into proliferation, connective tissue synthesis. Okay, another way of saying all that is healing. Okay, so at one month, okay, so really the bottom line is when you're hurt, you really have to give the body four weeks to heal. Okay, let me say that better, to begin healing, All right? Now, in my world, in the kind of clinic that I run and the kind of patients I see, this is very, very difficult for people to tap into, all right, because I see a lot of active people and they're hurt and they're still wanting to train and they got the meat coming up, they've got the event, they've got the whatever. And they're like, I don't care that my ankle's about to fall off. I've got this thing coming up and I just need to get through it. I'm like, okay, you're not allowing your body to heal. You're disrupting everything your body is trying to do within that first month. Okay, so, Um, so it's very difficult to get people to do this. Or some form of it. Rest, ice, compression, elevation. Okay, rest is very important. Ice is very important. Okay, remove the provocative activity by resting. Create an anti-inflammatory environment by icing. It depends on the tissue and the nature of the injury. And then that would be followed by compression and elevation. Okay. Now, after your one month period, then you're starting to get into some really good uh, tissue healing stuff, right? So epithelialization and collagen formation. Another way of saying this is scar tissue is trying to come in and fix the hurt area. And this remodeling, all right, this collagen formation, epithelialization, remodeling can last up to two years. Okay, depends on the nature of the injury, the body part that's hurt, the age of the person, pre existing conditions, and all that stuff. For example, if you have a basic everyday cut on the back of your hand, that will heal pretty quick, okay? Probably all be gone within four weeks. If you tear through an ACL and a meniscus, well, that's not gonna be one month. That's gonna be probably six to 12 months, okay? Because the vascular supply and all that kind of stuff to the knee, to that particular tissue is not as good as the skin and all that on the back of your hand that you just cut. 
okay? So it just depends on the tissue, the age of the person, the severity of the injury, and so on, all right? So uh, it can be as quick as a month, up to two years of healing. And even after that two-year mark, you're still going through remodeling. The body is still constantly trying to uh, improve it. Okay, um, with negative feedback mechanism, your body will adjust the amount of cholesterol produced by the liver in accordance with your diet. All right. Um, So high cholesterol intake inhibits synthesis by the liver. Um, because of this, the restriction of cholesterol from your diet uh, does not necessarily lead to a steep reduction of plasma or blood cholesterol levels. Okay, In general, the best you can do is about a 15% improvement in your score because about 15% comes from diet. Okay, saturated and unsaturated fatty acids. All right, so saturated fatty acids um, stimulate the liver synthesis of cholesterol and inhibits its excretion from the body. And since saturated fatty acids are found, found in animal fats, um, reducing the amount of, you, of saturated fat intake can lower your cholesterol score. Okay, so the range is actually 15 to 20% of a score reduction. The unsaturated fatty acids, okay, which is found in vegetable oils, can enhance excretion of cholesterol and its catabolism to bile salts. One thing you have to watch out for is unsaturated fatty acids, okay, and hydrogenation. So partially hydrogenated, you also hear the word fractionated. So they remove a hydrogen to give the food a longer shelf life. Okay, that's not good for you. Okay, so the, it's a good idea to try to stay away from uh, hydrogenated products. And it'll say it on the, um, you know, the nutrition label, right? It tells you how many calories, and all that stuff, and it should tell you on there uh, if it's hydrogenated. And they tried to get clever to hide that by saying fractionated. Okay. What happens is this produces trans fatty acids. Okay, so trans fatty acids can cause serum changes and make it worse in your body. All right, so the trans fatty acids can increase those LDLs and decreases the HDL, which is the good cholesterol, okay, creating some very unhealthy ratios. Okay, omega-3s is a healthy fatty acid. It's actually an essential fatty acid. I am a big fan of supplementing and you know, encouraging my patients and everyone to supplement with uh, fish oil or better said, essential fatty acids or EFAs, okay? Uh, they help lower cholesterol. It is healthy for the heart. It can prevent blood clots. It can prevent uh, platelet aggregation. It helps lower blood pressure, um, embryological development, all the studies that they've shown with that, it really, really helps uh, mom and baby during pregnancy. It helps reduce postpartum depression. A lot of, a lot of that work was done by, um, what's the guy's name? The book is called The Omega-3 Connection. Let me look it up real quick.
uh, Andrew Stoll, Dr. Stoll, Dr. Andrew Stoll. Okay, so he was one of the first people to come up with um, the idea that fish oil and omega-3s and all that is good for you. This was back in the 90s. Of course, his peers were like, are you kidding me? All the fancy technology and the medication we have, and you think fish is what's going to help people? Dude, he got ripped apart back in the 90s for coming up with some foo-foo, fairy, whatever thing, fish oil. Okay, and now look at today, 2020. What do people think of fish oils? It's like amazing. There's prescriptions, pharmaceutical companies are making it. There's like a million companies that have jumped on board. Like it's just everywhere. Why? Because it's good for, there's so many things that are good for you. Um, it reduces inflammation. Uh, in, uh, increases the integrity of the plasma membranes. So cell to cell communication becomes better. It increases your mental capacity. Okay, there was a, I mean, there's lots of studies on this, but one in particular, I think this happened in Richmond, California. They took, I think it was, they took 400 um, high school students and they gave them this test. Okay, just some sort of test. Uh, basic arithmetic, basic, you know, unscramble these words and whatever, just kind of easy stuff, but they gave them a test. And then they split the group up. I think it was 200 on one side, 200 on the other. And they gave the 200 a placebo, probably just a water pill. And then they gave the other side uh, omega-3s. And I think they did that for four to six weeks. And then they gave them a very similar test. And the people that were on the omegas did remarkably better, not only from their the first time they took the test, but compared to the placebo group. And that's it. They didn't do, there was no coaching, no tutoring, no nothing, no studying. All they did was give them uh, omegas just to see what would happen. Okay, so other things that can affect cholesterol is smoking, uh, stress, excessive coffee, actually better said, it's the caffeine, okay, the excessive caffeine. You wanna to try to limit your coffee to two to three cups a day, okay? Um, so coffee by itself is fine, right? So there's a lot of actually benefits that can come from coffee. It's grown from the ground. And there's, you know, a lot of advocates out there that say, you know, there's certain health benefits to coffee, but like anything, too much of anything is not good for you. Okay, a sedentary lifestyle, not good. And pro-inflammatory diets is certainly not good uh, to affect a cholesterol. High in trans fatty acids, high in high fructose corn syrup, high amounts of caffeine, um, high amounts of MSG, food coloring, your blue 40s, your yellow number six and all that. Those are DNA synthesis. Inhibitors. Okay, so you want to try to avoid those food colorings. And then your abnormal omega-6 to 9 to 3 ratios. Okay, 6 and 9s usually go together because they are gotten, they are obtained from anything grown from the ground and animal products other than fish. Okay, omega-6 and 9s are, are obtained through diet of anything grown from the ground and any animal product other than fish. And guess how much we consume of things grown from the ground. Think about how many corn chips people eat. I mean, just abnormal amounts of corn grown from the ground. So in other words, the omega-6 and 9 compared to the 3s, the ratios are significantly off and that is very pro-inflammatory okay they need to be a one to one ratio um kind of on a bad day you don't really want them to exceed like a one to four ratio and most people when they studied are about between a one and twenty one and twenty ratio up to a one and forty very pro 
inflammatory. Now you can test for this. You can test for your omega three, six, and nine levels. Um, I do this with my patients. Uh, lots and lots and lots of studies out there on it. Okay, and if you were to review these studies, what you would find is this, that just about everybody, their ratios are off. So if in doubt, if you don't know your actual numbers, just take omega-3s. I would use caution if you're gonna supplement with omega-6, 9s, and 3s because you don't know what your ratios currently are, okay? So if you don't know, just take omega-3s. Okay, if you do know, then you can play with the dose of three, six, and nines. Okay, so medical solutions would be to put people on statin drugs uh, to try to reduce cholesterol. Alternative medical approaches would be more dietary changes, lowering inflammation, stress management, exercise, supplementation, and this should say therapies. Okay, so different, uh, different therapies from physical therapy to counseling to whatever. All right, you have those who eat to live and those who live to eat. Okay, so weight gain versus weight loss is a matter of discipline. It is also math. Okay, now this is old school, and this is uh, the more difficult route, but it is the better route of weight loss, okay? And here's what I mean. Number one, of what you eat, it needs to be quality food, okay? No more 40 packs of beer a day, all right? No more seven to eight king-size uh, Skittles and M&Ms and all that stuff. Okay, no more three to four of your Vente Frappuccino stuff from Starbucks every day. And on and on we could go with the you don't need that food list. All right. So we are going, it's, it, it is math. We're going to change uh, your, your diet. We're going to kind of quick version, an easy version. We're going to just start eating clean. Stay away from this stuff and stick with this. And then you want to try to throw in some basics of exercise. It doesn't have to be high end and crazy. It can be as simple as a brisk walk 30 minutes a day. Okay. And as minimal as three to four days a week. So if people can lower their gastrointestinal inflammation and their body inflammation, if they can start eating clean and do just a little bit of exercise, you're going to start to see results. Now, there's about 75 million different fad diets out there. My personal opinion on diets is you just got to pick one that works. Now, I use a more scientific approach to diets. Um, you know, if people come in, well, you know, this one thing that was done on the south part of, you know, the space station and they ate this whatever astronaut food. And I'm like, fine, if that works for you, great. Okay. Um, what I care about is that you lower inflammation, eat clean, and you, you find out what you can eat through labs. Okay. There are lab panels, uh, food panel, food lab panels that you can do to find out exactly what you can and cannot have. Okay. Once you do that, once you stay away from the junk, and you have the labs that tell you what you can and can't have, you, you have everything. That's all you need. Now you can pick whatever diet works for you. Okay, if it's the astronaut diet, fine. If it's the keto diet, fine. If it's the Mediterranean diet, the paleo diet, the I don't care diet, once you know what you can and cannot have based on laboratory studies, and you are going to eat clean, then pick any diet you want. Okay, that's why I really don't care the diet as long as you know what you can and can't have. Then what happens is you're going to lower inflammation. Okay, you're going to feel better. And also what usually comes with that package is you're going to start to lose some weight as well. All right, so the neural signals 
from the digestive tract um, will also start to uh, improve, okay? So the pro-inflammatory stuff is now going away. The neurological communication is starting to improve. Uh, if you're throwing in exercise, the metabolism starts to get better, okay? And all sorts of other um, physiological factors will take place to help, okay? It's, it, it does take a lot of discipline. You have to resist eating out. Uh, you have to resist the fast food, resist the candies, and that's tough, right? It is tough to uh, enjoying those nice big frappuccinos and, you, you know, you just can't have them anymore. Okay, it's very difficult for people, but it is doable. Okay, other things that people will do is they'll do water pills uh, because in a form of a diuretic to lose water, to lose weight, okay? They'll do uh, other fad diets like artificial meal replacement shakes, okay? The key word there is artificial. They put a bunch of chemicals in there to make it taste good, to get this stuff down. Chances are there's also a lot of filler and soy and other zenestrogens and stuff like that within the, the protein or the, the meal replacement shakes. So um, there are good companies and there are not good companies that make this stuff. All right. So if people are going to go down this route, the best thing to do is get from a good, reputable uh, company. Okay. Not some thing that's over the counter at you know, Walmart, you're not going to get a good product there. Uh, some people will opt for surgery, wire the jaw shut, uh, stomach stapling, bypass surgery, okay, uh, biliopancreatic diversion, liposuction, lap band, and whatever. Okay, on and on it goes to do what they can to lose weight. Um, the uh, BPD, so the biliopancreatic diversion rearranges the digestive tract and two thirds of the stomach is removed. The small intestine is cut in half and the pancreatic and bile are diverted away and into the new intestine. That sounds horrible, okay? I don't know why anybody would volunteer for that, but some people do, okay? If it's for emergency reasons because of cancers and infections and diverticulitis and Crohn's disease, I get it. But just as an everyday thing, um, just to do it, like I would not recommend that, okay? Uh, BMR is basal metabolic rate. Okay, this is the amount of energy you need to survive. So you can kind of look at this as if you were in a coma, okay, how much energy would it take to keep you alive? That is your BMR. Okay, now listen, that's not what it is. It's just kind of to give you a visual of what we're working with. If you were in a coma, how much energy does it take to keep your body alive? That's your basal metabolic rate. Okay, the energy cost of living. Um, so an average uh, 154 pound or 70 kilogram male would have a BMR of 60 to 70, 72 calories per hour, okay? Um, also, what is going to influence this is uh, thyroid hormone, okay, or your thyroxine. So the amount of thyroid hormone that's being released in your body is going to also help determine your BMR. Keep in mind, Thyroid hormone is also known as your metabolic hormone. Okay, your total metabolic rate is uh, how many calories you need because of your daily activities. So you, get, you have to consider if you're in a coma, all the calories you need just to survive in a coma plus your daily activities. Okay, so... Are you a person that, you know, basically sits all the time and you compare that to a person who, uh, you know, gets up and let's say they do 40 minutes at the gym doing some weights. And then at the end of the day, they cycle, row, swim, run, whatever. Okay. Or they're doing CrossFit. They're doing Orange Theory. They're training for uh, the Spartan race. 
um, and whatever. All right. So as you can imagine, you have basically an inactive person. So they're going to have a lower total metabolic rate. And if you have an active person, they're going to have a higher total metabolic rate. The more calories you burn because of exercise and all that stuff, the more food you're going to need. And that's okay. All right. If all of a sudden you start training for a triathlon, believe me, your appetite's going to go up. You're going to start to consume more calories. Okay. Skeletal muscle is responsible for a large portion of the total metabolic rate. So one of the best things that you can do if you want to increase your metabolism is to increase lean muscle mass. Okay. When you exercise and increase not only your aerobic part of you, but the anaerobic part of you, you're certainly going to increase your total metabolic rate, which is the rate at which your body burns fuel at a minimum. Okay. And this is to benefit the heart 30 to 45 minutes three to five days a week, okay? Getting up to the target heart rate, which you wanna get, depending on your age and all that stuff, anywhere from 100 beats per minute to uh, 120, okay? If you are more, this would be mild exercise. If you're more moderate, it would be 120 to 160. Well, let's say 150 to 160. And then if you're uh, hardcore, okay, you're going to get that heart rate up to 150, 160 plus, okay, hitting 180. And I mean, you're really getting up there, All right? That's hard to do. Uh, that hurts to get it up to that level and keep it there. But uh, the mild to moderate stuff is just fine. Okay, um, a kilocalorie or a calorie or a kcal or a C, depending on the author, they all mean the same thing. It's the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one kilogram of water, one degree Celsius. All right, that's where we get it from. It's energy. Okay, so a carbohydrate will give you four calories per gram. A protein also gives you four calories per gram. Fat gives you nine calories per gram. So when we eat, we typically eat uh, proteins, fats, and carbs. Okay. So if food has 35 grams of a protein, so protein is 35, so you're going to multiply that times four and 50 grams of a carb okay we know carbs 50 grams times four because remember it's four calories per gram 50 grams so 50 times four and then 10 grams of fat so the fat would be 10 times nine okay so then you would do your math to figure out how many calories that uh, you just consumed. <clears throat> okay, so this would be 140. So that would be 430 calories at that particular meal. Okay. So you can calorie count. You can look at nutrition labels. Um, you know, it, it depends on where you're at in life, meaning am I on a diet? Am I trying to watch what I eat? Am I trying to lose weight? Or am I trying to gain weight? Am I trying to increase in my strength, increase in my aerobic abilities and whatever? Okay. It just depends on where you're at. Okay, this is uh, honestly extremely generic. Okay, so, because uh, everyone's different, but in general, uh, with a typical American diet, your carbs, about 50 to 60% of your 
overall calorie intake can be from carbs. Your protein, you want about 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight of consumption. And then your fat up to 30% of your uh, caloric intake can come from fat. If you're on a keto diet, okay, you'll want um, something like this. Let's say, uh, I'm kind of making these numbers up, but let's say 40% is from um, protein and 60% is from fat. Well, let's do this. 55% is from fat, okay? That leaves you with 5% that you can play with with a carb, okay? It depends on how aggressive you wanna be in ketosis. Uh, your general rule with ketosis when it comes to carbs or carbohydrates is zero to 20% of your diet can come from carbs and still be considered in a ketogenic state, okay? Now that is gonna have to be measured through your urine dipsticks. So when I work with people on their keto diet, um, again, I like the more scientific method. And so one of the things that we do is um, make sure that we're doing the dipsticks. So you pee in a cup, you take the dipstick, you dump it in the urine or you put it in the urine and then you wait for the reaction to take place. And depending on the color of the dipstick depends on what phase in ketosis they are. Just a little bit, are they moderate or are they a lot of bit? Okay, the dipsticks will tell you. I've had people come in I was up for the last six months. I've been doing the best I can to be on the ketogenic diet, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not seeing any results. And I'm like, okay, well, let's go ahead and do a urine analysis real quick. And so they pee in a cup and we dip. It's like, look, you're not even in ketosis. What have you been doing for the last six months? Well, I thought I was doing the right thing. So sometimes when people are trying to do this on their own, they may not be doing it right. Okay. So, um, so sometimes it's a good idea to get, let's just say a coach or someone who knows how to help you navigate through this territory. And, um, you know, there's nutritionists out there, there's functional medicine people, you know, I do the functional medicine slash nutrition part. And I uh, use the scientific method, which means we do labs, we're doing urine analysis, Okay, we're doing things that are more detailed to figure out exactly what we, what your body can and cannot handle. It takes out the guessing game. It takes out all problems. Okay, it's very, very nice. And then once we have that information, then depending on your goals, depends on the route that we go with your diet and lifestyle. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay, let's get to uh, repro. Okay, uh, reproductive system, and this should end our lecture stuff. And so next week, we're going to start diving into some labs, just to give you a heads up. Okay. So next week, we'll do blood vessels. Uh, depending on how long that takes, you know, we may throw in cardio, but nevertheless, November 10th will be cardio. November 17 will be uh, urine analysis stuff, renal, GI. November 24th, is Thanksgiving week, so no school that week. And then December 1st will be lab test. And then December 8th will be uh, test number two, which is blood vessels through repro, okay? 
Okay, uh, anatomy of male reproductive system. Okay, so um, the scrotum is a two-chambered sac that contains the testes separated by the, uh, the raphe, the dartos, and the cremesteric muscles help regulate temperature. So in other words, um, if the, the, the scrotum and the testes and all that are too warm, the muscles relax and elongate and allow the scrotum to, to move away from the body. And if things are too cold, then the cremesteric muscle will contract to bring the scrotum closer to the body because the sperm is very sensitive to changes in temperature. Okay, the perineum is the uh, area, the diamond shaped area between thighs. Okay, it connects the scrotum to the anus. Uh, in women, this would be the area where they would likely get um, an episiotomy if things don't go well, so to speak, during child delivery, right? So baby's head's coming out and with the birth canal, there can be some tearing. So they'll do um, an incision in that perennial area. Okay, so men and women have that uh, perineum. Okay, the testes located outside the body cavity and uh, found in the scrotum. Okay, the sperm, I mean, excuse me, the testes serve as both the exocrine gland because sperm cells are secreted and an endocrine gland because it helps uh, with the production of testosterone. Okay, the tubes through which the sperm move are the seminiferous tubules. Okay, um, also, um, let's see. There it is, there's the, uh, so an, epi, an episiotomy, okay, will usually, um, uh, basically cut off that area, okay? So that sperm does not travel uh, out and down, okay? And meet, and, and, and meet up with the semen. So that's what happens during, and, um, Okay, and then you have the, uh, let's see, the sperm itself has the head and the midpiece and the tail. Okay, on a naturopathic note, if a male sperm has poor motility, okay, that is um, likely due to a deficiency in um, coenzyme A, okay. So mitochondria does really well with um, coenzyme A. And sometimes, you know, couples will have some sort of fertility issue, whether it's slow uh, sperm motility on the male side. And, there, you know, there can be some other issues, low testosterone, not enough um, uh, testosterone production or sperm production, whatever, low count but it also could be low motility. And so an easy uh, thing to do is treat with coenzyme, uh, uh, coenzyme A to increase the mitochondria. Okay, it's actually pretty remarkable. Okay, don't worry about this part. All right, crypt uh, cordiasm is failure of one or both testes to descend into the scrotum. Okay, this would prevent uh, sperm development. The testes can actually get stuck kind of anywhere inside of the uh, lower abdominal cavity area. All right, uh, these days uh, the surgeries to fix that are pretty successful. Okay, so here's the testes there. They are designed to eventually descend into the scrotum as time goes by. Okay, but sometimes um, at birth that uh, doesn't happen and they stay, you know, somewhere up in the abdom lower abdominal cavity. OK, 
Okay, follicle stimulating hormone and testosterone help to, um, and follicle stimulating hormone help with uh, sperm production. Okay, so spermatogenesis. Okay, don't worry about that one. And don't worry about that one, not gonna get into uh, all that. All right. From this one, I do want you to know that the epididymis is the site of sperm cell maturation. It takes about one to two days for this to happen. Okay. The ductus differens, also known as the vas differens, which is where you get your, okay, the vasectomy. Um, now, I'm not promoting this. I am just letting everybody know that this is what's going on. Usually I get questions on that, but uh, basically they're just trying to take a tube and kink it so that the sperm does not go from point A to point B. Okay, um, true story, true story. Uh, about eight years ago, um, had a couple come in and he had a vasectomy and she was actually on birth control and they still got pregnant. Okay, so that child's about eight years old now, but uh, that was definitely a thing. That's not, they weren't in there for, you know, any kind of fertility issues. They were both active and they were just having, you know, musculoskeletal pain uh, just from being like too active. Okay, that's why they were there. Back pain, knee pain, you know, that kind of thing. Just something that happened to happen during that time. So that's why they say it's 99.99% effective because there's always that 0 0.01 chance that it happens. <laughs> and that was one of them. <clears throat> okay, the ejaculatory uh, duct is the joining of the ductus difference and the seminal vesicle. All right, the uh, female reproductive organs would include ovaries, uterine tubes, uterus, vagina, okay, and mammary glands. Okay, the broad ligament, okay, which you see here, right, broad ligament, uh, this is actually something that is really nice to treat during pregnancy. Because what happens is as the uterus enlarges, okay, um, it can actually move to one side or the other, okay? It becomes off-centered. And uh, so let's say it moves to the person's right, okay? So let's say it moves that way. That puts a lot of tension on that left broad ligament. So there's a lot of cool soft tissue work that you can do to relax that area to bring things back to the middle, okay? And believe me, these moms-to-be, thank you, tremendously because it takes a lot of pressure off of you know what they're experiencing okay uh, you also have these suspensatory ligaments okay so those are going to uh, contain the ovaries so help keep them into place um, the suspensatory ligaments can be uh, let's just say hurt in athletes, okay? Because what happens is right behind uh, this area, you have the iliopsoas muscle, okay? And the constant um, hip flexion that comes with running and all the stuff that comes with sport can create adhesions in this area and start to hurt the suspensatory ligaments and all that kind of thing. And, and these athletes, these female athletes, they tend to notice this. Now they don't say it this way, okay? But what the athlete is really saying is every time I get an ovarian problem, like an ovarian cyst or whatever, it's always on my left side or it's always on my right side. Well, if that's the case, let's say it's always on the left side, you'll find that that's the side that has the most adhesions from the many, many years of activity. Okay. It's also very 
uh, a pretty easy thing to fix, right? So you just get in there and do your soft tissue work to release those adhesions and get your suspensatory ligament integrity back. Okay, ovulation is the release of the secondary uh, oocyte from the ovary. Okay, and then fertilization begins when the sperm will bind to that secondary oocyte. And then once it penetrates the, 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 plas the, the cytoplasm, you know, then you get into where the, it opens up and the nuclear material, and then um, cells start to divide and, you know, conception and all that begins. Okay, don't worry about that, except for the fallopian tubes. I uh, do want you to know that the fallopian tubes are what carry the egg from the ovary to the uterus. Okay, and there are um, cilia uh, found inside the fallopian tube to help move the egg from point A to point B. Okay, we, the three layers of the uterus is the endometrium, uh, the inside most, the middle layer is the myometrium, very strong muscle. Okay, and this is what also responds to oxytocin during childbirth with the contractions, and then the outside, the perimetrium. Okay, um, menstrual cycles tend to last about 28 days. You kind of, on general, have day one to day 14, and then day 14 to 28, and then it starts over again. Okay, so you can, uh, if, and, and I do try to encourage my female patients, if they're not counting their cycles, to count them, to keep track, okay? I think it's very important to know that and to do that. And also another reason for me wanting them to keep a calendar of this stuff is um, hormone induced headaches. Okay, hormone induced headaches. All right, so uh, the pituitary gland functions a lot of reproductive stuff, okay? Your follicle stimulating hormone, your luteinizing hormone, okay, they come from the pituitary gland and uh, what it can happen is that pituitary gland, which sits in the cella tersica, okay, that releases your follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. If it's working too hard, the gland can swell. Okay, it actually enlarges and hits the bony surrounding. It hits the cella tersica, and it causes you know visual disturbances, migraine, auras, spots, that kind of thing. And uh, so that the migraines are either hormone related or something else, okay? And one of the best ways to find out is if we have, if you go back to your calendar, oh look, every time day 13, 14 hits, you get a headache, and every time around day 28, you get a headache, very consistent every single month, now we're on to something, okay? Now we can start treating the hormones. But if the headaches and migraines are all over the place, and there's no rhyme or reason, it's probably not hormonal, it's something else, okay? Then we go down that route. Okay, amenorrhea would be the absence of menstrual cycles. A uh, lot of different reasons for that to be caused. Um, it can either be a medication thing, which usually is intentional, or it could be the percent body fat gets too low, okay? For women in general, if they hit 15% or less, so now they're at 9% or whatever, it actually shuts off monthly cycles, okay? Um, sometimes this is done intentionally, like gymnasts that are preparing for a big meet or whatever. Uh, something, sometimes you'll find this in anorexic uh, people, you know, whatever. There, there could be things that are going on uh, that are causing the amenorrhea. And in a clinical situation, you know, you know, these things are important to dive in with history. What's your goal? What are you doing? 
Um, is this healthy for you? Is this not healthy for you? Because otherwise, uh, in the long, long run, you know, it can create some problems, okay? So, and then menopause would be the sensation of menstrual cycles. Uh, somewhere using the age 40s, 50s and up, you'll start to uh, get into this, okay? All right, any questions or anything over all of that? Okay. <laughs>